foot down. Oh. So I'll start with the Halley's theorem. Uh, for any family of convex sets in RD, if every d plus one tuple intersects, then the whole family intersects. Is microphone on? Ah. So then there's a, also a fractional version of Halley's theorem. Uh, if many of the d plus 1 tuples intersect, then a large subfamily intersects. And another related version is for all d and p, there exists a constant c, such that for any family of convex sets in Rd, if every p tuple Sorry, yeah, if every p-tuple has at least d plus 1 intersecting members, then the family is pierced by c points. And by pierce, we mean a family F pierces a family A when every member of A intersects some member of F. So for example, if we look at these six convex sets in the plane, and we pick out any four of them, always three out of four will intersect, have a common intersection. And so this satisfies the condition. So there are a finite number of points that pierce the family, in this case two points. And the important thing is that uh, the number of points doesn't depend on the size of the family, only on the dimension and the size of P. And this is kind of like a, you can see this is similar to Halley's theorem. You have this local condition that implies this global condition. And if p is equal to d <coughs> plus 1, then Halley's theorem says exactly that c is equal to 1. People have also considered uh, some transversal versions, which is what I'll talk about. So a k-transversal of a family of sets A is a k-flat, or a k-dimensional affine subspace, that intersects every member of A. And this began, some early results were for line transversals to unit balls, beginning with uh, Dancer and Hedwiger in 1957. So rather than looking at convex sets that intersect, we're looking at unit balls that have a line passing through each unit ball. And this research has continued on and on, and, and a recent result is that for any family of disjoint unit balls in Rd, if every 4D minus 1 tuple has a line transversal, then the whole family has a line transversal. And there are other transversal theorems. So there is a PQ piercing theorem for hyperplane transversals to families of convex sets. So another type of theorem that these are related to are, well, so our, our th theorem is now for k transversals of unit balls. And we have both a, a fractional piercing version, which says that for any d and any k and any alpha positive, there exists a beta positive such that for any family of n unit balls in Rd, if an alpha fraction of the k plus w two tuples have a k transversal, then a beta fraction of the entire family has a k transversal. And we also show a PQ piercing theorem for K transversals of unit balls, which says for any D, K, and P, there exists a C such that for any family of unit balls in Rd, if every P tuple has at least K plus two members with a K transversal, then the family is pierced by C many K flats. And these kinds of heli type theorems are also related to the epsilon net theorem. So I define a weak epsilon net for two classes of sets X and Y as follows. A family E 
in the class X is a weak epsilon net for another family F in the same class X when E pierces all sets of in the class Y that intersect at least an epsilon fraction of F. So here we see the formula and symbols. And the more familiar version of weak epsilon nets is for points and convex sets. So we, there's a theorem that for all D and all epsilon there exists a C such that any point set in RD has a weak epsilon net of C points. And we can use this also for the PQ piercing theorem to prove a PQ piercing theorem. So the earlier theorem that I showed you for hyperplane transversals to convex sets, there was a PQ piercing theorem that was proved in this way. And they also gave a general method for proving PQ piercing theorems that says for classes of sets X and Y, if X pierces Y and a fractional piercing theorem holds for X transversals of Y and a weak epsilon net theorem also holds for these classes, then a PQ piercing theorem must hold. And since we prove it in this way, we also will add to our list of theorems a weak epsilon net theorem for K transversals of unit balls. <coughs> so I'll go through the proof briefly of the fractional piercing theorem and the weak epsilon net theorem, starting with the fractional piercing theorem. Sorry, what is yes. Ah, a, a, a K flat is a K dimensional affine subspace. So a one flat is a line, and a D minus one flat is a hyperplane. <coughs> so the basic idea is we use a charging scheme to find K plus one balls that are in many K plus two tuples that each have a K transversal. And then we consider two cases, the case where the balls are dense and the case where these balls are sparse. And in the dense case, we'll see the balls are in a small volume. And in the sparse case, we'll see the K transversals are highly constrained by the balls being far apart. And so the K transversals will have to be close together. So this is the charging scheme. First, we define the diameter sequence. So the usual diameter is just the maximum distance between points. And now, for the diameter sequence, we define it recursively. We start by letting S1, the first set, be equal to original set S. And then we define more sets, SI, to be the orthogonal projection of the previous set, SI minus 1, to the complement of the direction of a diameter of SI minus 1. So that means we, we find our diameter and the direction, w the direction of the diameter, we complement, we, sorry, we project orthogonal to that, then we find a new diameter and project orthogonally again, and then keep doing this. And the diameter sequence is the diameter of the sequence of sets. And we should also see that the sequence of sets is not uniquely defined, but we make the diameter sequence uniquely defined by taking the lexicogra lexicographically maximal sequence. So now we sort the k plus 1 tuples of balls lexicographically by the diameter sequence of their center points, and we assign each k plus 2 tuple that has a k transversal to its greatest k plus 1 subtuple. Now let S be the center points of the k plus 1 tuple that has the greatest charge. And let W be the affine span of the center points S. And let pi be the orthogonal projection to the complement of W. So here we can see we have these k plus 2 tuples assigned to T. Each one will consist of one extra ball that's not in T. And since n choose k plus 2 is a linear factor greater than n choose k plus 1, we have these 
balls, the extra balls of each k plus one tuple is a positive fraction of the family of all balls. In addition, each of these extra balls that are assigned to this tuple T by this charging scheme will have a k flat transversal with the k plus one balls in T. And if we replace any ball in T with one of the extra balls assigned to T, the diameter sequence will decrease. This is the, what we have now. So let's consider the dense case. In the dense case, since the, so we, we give an example here with two balls, since the diameter will go down if we replace any one of these balls with one of the extra balls of the k plus 2 tuple, the k plus, the extra ball can only be so far away from these balls. And then if we look at the projection into w complement, this will also be bounded. And if we look at the sparse case, in this case we look at the, the kth diameter, so in, in, in both of them where you look at whether the kth diameter is small or the kth diameter is large, if the kth diameter is large, then we see that the slope of any k transversal to the space w, the affine span of their centers, will be bounded by the some big O of the reciprocal of the kth diameter. So we look at our balls, we look at any, in this case, any line transversal will be bounded if the balls are far apart from each other. And then we look at uh, In, in addition to this, again, the extra ball can only be so far away from the first, from the, from T, because the diameter sequence will go down if we replace one of the balls with the extra ball. So then the projection into W complement will be bounded as well. What we have is that in each of these cases, for any ball of a k plus one uh, of a k plus two tuple assigned to T, the projection of that ball is bounded, and this means just by uh, uh, volume counting volume, there is some point in the projection of a positive fraction of the balls, and this means that the preimage of that point under this projection will be a k-transversal for a positive fraction of balls. The other thing we'll show is a weak epsilon net theorem. So for all d, k, and epsilon, we will show that there's a weak epsilon net of a certain size. So what we need is for some family of n many flats, we'll choose another family of flats that intersect any ball that intersects a large number of those flats. So we start by choosing a sequence of unit balls such that each ball meets an epsilon fraction of the flats in F, and at least half of the flats do not meet any previous ball in this sequence. So, and this, this can be any sequence, any such sequence, this may not be a unique sequence, but we want to choose a maximal one, and we know that this sequence can only be of size 2 over epsilon, because each time there is at least epsilon over 2 new flats that meet some ball in the sequence. Then we assign each flat meeting some ball in the sequence to one of the balls that it meets, such that each ball gets at most epsilon, an epsilon fraction of the flats assigned to it. Then we will construct a weak epsilon over 4 net for the flats assigned to each of the balls. So I'll skip that part for now. But it, once we have this, we look at, for any ball B meeting an epsilon fraction of F, in order to show that we have a weak epsilon net for these flats, what we need is a set of flats that will intersect this ball B, any such ball B. 
So by the pigeonhole principle, we can see that at least epsilon squared n over 4 of those flats are in some fi, one of the flats assigned to one of the balls, just because uh, b must meet at least uh, a certain number of flats, at least uh, epsilon over 2 of the flats have to meet some previous ball, and then there are only 2 over epsilon such balls. And by the weak epsilon net that we construct for the family of flats assigned to each ball, one of the flats in that epsilon net must meet this ball B. So if we take the union of all of these weak epsilon over 4 nets for, the flat, for each Fi, then that will be a weak epsilon net for F. So then we have to see how do we construct a weak epsilon over 4 net for flats assigned to a ball. So now we just know that the flats are close together. We start by writing each flat as a linear equation and then we do Gaussian elimination with pivoting on the matrix to get a new matrix. And the important thing here is that the entries of this matrix will be bounded. Then we partition the flats according to the pivot columns of the Gaussian elimination. And now we'll construct a weak epsilon net for each of those partitions. And the way we do that is just by constructing a weak epsilon net for points in Rk d minus k first, where these, these points correspond to the non-pivot column entries of the matrix. Then <coughs> for each point in this weak epsilon net, which now corresponds to a set of matrices, we form a sufficiently large grid of k flats that are parallel to the space defined by the matrix corresponding to the point in the epsilon net, the weak epsilon net, centered around B. And the point here is that since the entries are bounded, this will bound the size that this grid has to be. And then our weak epsilon net for the balls, for the flats assigned to one ball, will just be the union of each of these grids for each of these weak epsilon nets. So this is the construction. I won't go through all of the, the details of the proof of that, but the last thing to say is that these arguments also work for sets of similar size. So if we know that each set is contained in a ball of a certain radius, large radius, and contains a ball of a certain small radius, these are kind of density arguments will also work. Uh, so that's all.